guest uh, today, uh, actually a couple guests, I just saw Edward uh, come in, um, Edward Terry uh, and uh, Paula Rash. Uh, Paula is our uh, uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences and um, Edward works in our pub, uh, publicity department. Well, we're very fortunate to have as our guest today uh, Michael Hardy. Uh, Michael Hardy is the 2010 recipient of the uh, North Carolina Historian of the Year Award. He was given that award in 2010 by the North Carolina Society of Historians. Michael is the author of 23 books, two of which are in our library. Uh, he is a graduate of the University of Alabama, who honored him in uh, 2012 with the Alice Parker Award for Outstanding Literature and Arts. In 2018, uh, he was the winner of the James I. Robertson uh, Literary Prize. Uh, we're very fortunate and happy to have him with us today. Uh, Michael, thanks for uh, speaking to us. We'll turn the class over to you. Good morning. Good morning. I am so glad that you're here. So glad that I am here. This is like the third or fourth time that I have been to your class. Y'all probably don't remember that. Any repeat offenders in here? No? Good. Um, third or fourth time I've been down sharing my love for history and maybe inspiring you just a little bit. Anybody here actually like history? Your professor's not looking right now. Good. That's good. I know the rest of y'all are just here for your three credit hours and to move on to go to some other place, and that's okay. I took classes like that, too, many years ago, as I'm sure your instructor did as well. History is complicated. And I, I cannot, even I'm going to try here in the next few minutes, but I cannot even begin to, to tell you how complicated history is and how how it's all wound together and how things that we know or that we think we know may not exactly be right it's only part of the story history our history history is a lot more than what we make out of it and when we get to mid 19th century united states history it is extremely complicated in that time period where we couldn't get along. And I want to start off, I have a couple of questions. Um, I had thought about writing them on the board, but I think I'm going to skip that. I have a couple of questions. A couple of things your professor wanted me to address, and a couple of other things that I, I want to talk about. But I want a little background first. This is a Southern culture class, right? What have you read about this time period, mid-19th century history? What have you read? Tell me where you're at. Young folks can read today, right? Y'all can read? <laughs> I'm smiling. You can't see that. but um, What did you read? Background reading. What is your textbook for this class? I took a Southern culture class like, I don't know, 25 years ago. They, have art, they don't have a, uh, a textbook on just the Civil War or the Southern history, but they have uh, some articles. Okay. They were supposed to read, uh, one was James McPherson's article, uh, All right. Out of War, A New Nation. Yeah. And also, A Blood of Shell from Laurel, that chapter from Trotter's book. All right. And also, um, excerpts from Sarah Morgan's diary. Okay, awesome. Company H. Company H, yes. Those were the main things. When we talk about that time period, this is a multifaceted question. What caused the war? Yes, in the back. Well, there were a lot of reasons. It was about war, I believe. Um, one being the inability to compromise, the other being sectionalism. Sectionalism. Did we ever get rid of sectionalism? No, we never did. Anyway, yeah. Sectionalism. That's great. 
Other, other thoughts. Why did we go to war against each other in 1860, 1861? Yes? Slavery. slavery. That was a part of it, yes. Like states' rights versus federal rights. States' rights versus federal rights. Yes. Big thing that we don't talk a whole lot about anymore, what you just said, states' rights versus um, federal rights. Complicated. I keep coming back to that word in the top of my head, complicated. Um, Y'all know who John C. Calhoun was? John C. Calhoun was an important South Carolina United States Senator. And a lot of folks say that John C. Calhoun was the father of secession. And that South Carolina was to blame. But if you go back and look through American history, United States history, not just Southern history, do you know where John C. Calhoun learned about secession? He learned about it when he was a student at Harvard, what's now Harvard University, when he was just a kid in the early 1800s. He got up there to Harvard Probably took a, a steamship. I don't actually remember how he got there. I'm sure a horse and a carriage was involved. And he's going to classes. And when he gets out of classes, he goes and hears these lectures. And the New England states want to leave the Union. Especially after we get to the War of 1812 time period. They were against the War of 1812. They wanted to protect their shipping industry that they had going on with England. I'm giving you the short version of this history. But John C. Calhoun didn't come up with the idea of secession. It actually been batted around in different states, north and south, for four score and seven years. New York actually had it in their state constitution that if a Bill of Rights was not passed, they could leave the Union. They would leave the Union. Alexander Hamilton broached that question with James Madison during the constitutional ratification debates in the 1780s. And I could go on and on and on and on and on about this. Slavery was mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, the Southerners' biggest qualms with slavery is that the Republican Party wanted to limit where, wanted to limit new slave states. That was one of their platforms in their convention. And the South is like this. Where in the Constitution does the federal government have that power? You can read it if you want. Constitution, the first 12 amendments. It's not in there. Federal government doesn't have that power. Most people, bringing the discussion back to Caldwell County and Watauga and all across North Carolina and all across the North, could care less about the issues that we assign to them. Kind of like people today. Now some of y'all may be politically active. You may have a cause that you're out there fighting for. Maybe more than one. Most people today and back then could care less about the issues at hand. I just want to go get, get up and I just want to go to work and I just want to come home and take care of my family. Just like today. That's what people were like back then. Now work was a little different back then. Most people were farmers. They usually didn't have very far to go to work unless they were taking a crop to the market down the road someplace. But it's still the same type of people. Most people didn't really care about the issues at hand. So when the war comes in 1860, 1861, here 1861, May, is when North Carolina left the Union. There were some soldiers who enlisted early on, April, here in North Carolina. Why do these men enlist in the Confederate Army? Originally. Give me some ideas. Why did they enlist? It's going to be a long hour. Why did they enlist? 
You know, there were roughly 3 million men who served in the Union and Confederate armies. About 2 million in the Union, almost a million in the Confederate armies. There were probably 4 million reasons why they enlisted. So hit me with some ideas. Why did they enlist? Possibly for their families. Possibly for their families, yes. Yes, sir. Money. Money. Oh, yes, money. Mm, money. We have this thing going on in the 1850s, late 1850s. It is a recession here in the United States. And there's not a lot of money being circulated. There's a great book by William Marvel. Come out a few years ago, not long ago. Uh, called Lincoln's Mercenaries. And William Marvel went through big cities like New York and looked at all of these one ads. Now today, we put one ads in the paper. If I'm a business owner and I have a business, I put a one ad. I am looking for people to hire. In the 1860s, if you were looking for a job, you would put an ad in the newspaper and say, Hey, here I am. I am a good tanner or a tenor. Or I make shoes. I'm a cooper. I'm looking for a job. Well, William Marvel discovered that in 1860, early 1861, there are hundreds of people in newspapers in New York City and in Boston and other places looking for a job because we got this recession going on. And what did he discover after April of 1861 when Lincoln has made that call for 75,000 troops to go into the Deep South and crush the rebellion? None of those people are looking for jobs anymore. They've all joined the federal army up there to get $21 a month or however much they paid. So money, you got it, money. We'll come back to the family in a minute. Money. What else? That's partially true here in the south as well. Even though we, unlike if we're in Caldwell County or Watauga, we are less of a money-driven society. We need enough money to pay our taxes. Outside of that, we're okay. We, we substance farm. We grow whatever we need to survive. And what we can't grow, what we can't produce on our farm, like coffee or sugar, uh, we grow a little extra to sell or trade or barter. That's a generalization, but more or less how it works. So we have family and we have money. Why else do we southern soldiers enlist or northern soldiers in 1861? Culture or socioeconomic status. Okay, culture, yes. We had ancestors, our fathers that marched away to fight in the Mexican-American War 20 years earlier. And we had our grandfathers had fought in the American Revolution. So yes, part of that culture is that when your state, that's the important word, calls for help, you go and enlist. And the state is the important part of the equation here. We don't have this unified federal republic like we do in 2021. North Carolina is my state. That is what is important that is the way the founders laid it out. So if you want to have an impact, politically speaking, you start with your county commissioners or your aldermen today in the General Assembly in Raleigh. Do we have an impact on what goes on in Washington, D.C. today? Not really, no. We really don't. But you can go down and you and you and you and you can go down to your county commissioners and raise a fuss about something and maybe get something changed. Maybe. So, you had your hand raised. Yeah, uh, fear of losing what they have. Fear of losing what you had. Very much true. Very much true. Behind him, you had another comment. Uh, I might go hand in hand with that, but I know some soldiers probably went to protect what they saw the rights. Right, right. So we have socioeconomic reasons because we have this recession going on and it's a chance if you're a Confederate soldier early in the war to go out and make $13 a month, which don't sound like a lot today, but it was a lot back then. 
Most people, if you go through and look at the census and break down the population into poorer folks, middle class folks, rich folks, it's just like it is today. Rich folks are this really small percentage of the population. Middle class, yeah, maybe 40% of the people might be middle class. Those are your store owners. Those are your doctors, your lawyers. Um, if you have a farm of several hundred acres, you may be middle class. Us poor folks are always at the bottom. Maybe 60, 55, 60% of the population. So $13 a month is a lot of money. So there's the socioeconomic reasons. Government's going to pay me $13 a month. Family reasons. We want to do what's right for our family. And we already kind of hit upon this. My father went and marched under Winfield Scott and defeated Santa Anta. Mexican-American War in the 1840s. My grandfather fought with George Washington and Richard Henry Lee during the American Revolution. So we have this military background. We have this military heritage. We didn't have a large standing army here in the United States at that point in time. In fact, it's really not until World War II that we do get a large standing army here in the United States. The way the Constitution was set up is that they feared large standing armies because we could see in European countries what happens when you have a large standing army. So we have county militias and state militias. And militias open up to any male between the ages change, but we'll say 18 and 40 it changes throughout the years. And if there's a need, then the governor will call out the state militia. That's the backbone of our military forces, is calling out that militia. So we have the whole family connection on that end. And then you've got the other end. Women were extremely patriotic in the 1860s. And they would say, hey, you're not going to join the army, so I'm not going to have anything to do with you. But if you want my love and affection, you'll go volunteer. And that happens time and time again. That peer pressure from members of the opposite sex. But then there's the peer pressure from your peers as well. Well, I'm excited. I'm going to go join the army. And many of these young men thought that the war would last how long? Three months. And that there would be one big battle. And as one Confederate soldier wrote, we would whip the Yanks with pen knives and cornstalks. And so early on, there is that motivation between your family group and your peer group. And if you didn't go in the list, then you might be considered a coward. And that stigma may stay with you for the rest of your life and affect you as you get older. Of course, nobody thought the war would last four years and kill 800,000 approximately men in the military. Some of them probably did enlist because of political reasons, a small fraction of them. There's a soldier, I've, I've been going through his letters um, from, um, he listed in the McDowell County Company, but he was living right there on the border, but he was in Yancey in 1860, in the 1860 census. And when he gets off and gets up into Virginia in early 1862, he writes that he's here because he more or less hates the abolitionist. And I want to back up and say, what does this fella in his 30s, married, very small farm, what does he actually know about the causes? Is that just something he has heard when he has got to Virginia and he's just repeating it back at home? What did he really understand? I can tell you by going through his letters, he's barely literate. Just, just not a whole lot of reading and writing going on in his family. But yes, there are some folks who do enlist for political reasons. There are some folks who enlist because of adventure. It's their opportunity to get off the mountain. That's what we say on my side of the mountain. It's their opportunity to get out of Happy Valley or the Globe area 
or the Lenore area. It's our chance to get away and go see part of the world that we've never seen, or at least part of the United States we've never seen before. But those early recruits in 1861 thought they would be back in home in time to gather the harvest in September and October of 1861. They didn't think they would be gone very long. Peer pressure, family responsibilities, money, some with political convictions. Some of them just wanted to get away. I was talking to a fellow the other day, and I can't remember where his ancestor was from, but it was someplace here in western North Carolina. He goes off. He's got a big family back at home. He goes off, joins the army, when the, survives the war. When the war is over, he heads to Missouri and starts him a whole other family and abandons his family here. I guess he was tired of his familiar responsibilities wherever here in the mountains that he lived. I think he was in Wilkes County. They just wanted to get away. Some of them went because they were convicted of the cause that the North didn't have the right to tell the South what to do. And it's not just the slavery issue. One of the first things the North does, the U.S. Congress does, after all the Southern delegates have left the U.S. Congress and returned South, is the North passes a bill to help finance the Transatlantic Railroad, the Trans-Pacific Railroad. They had been trying for years to do that, and the South kept saying, look, it's our tax dollars. The South was providing the vast majority of the tax dollars to the country at that point in time. It's our tax dollars. This railroad that's going to, to reach from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Pacific Ocean is not going to benefit us one single bit. So we're not going to pass it. We're no interest. You know, it's not going to help us. It's not going to help us get products to the market. You know, it's just no use to us whatsoever. And when the southern delegates are out of the U.S. Congress, that bill passes within three or four months. Transcontinental Railroad. So these men, thousands of them, 26,000 from Western North Carolina alone, go and join the Confederate Army. Early 1861, there's a second group in late 1861 when we figure out it's not going to be a six-month war or a three-month war. It's going to go on a little longer. And then there's a group in early 1862 because the Confederate government is saying, hey, we're going to have to start drafting people. It's called conscript bill. And, you know, there's a grace period given. And so if you enlist in that period of time, you are not considered a blight on your family because you have volunteered. You were not forced into the army because of the government. So that takes approximately 26,000 men from the western North Carolina counties. John C. Insco and Gordon McKinney write in their history of western North Carolina in the war that the enlistment in the western part of the state outpaces the rest of the state in 1861. There are more men from the mountains joining the Confederate Army in 1861. If you're really interested in this topic, let me encourage you to check out that book, The Heart of Confederate Appalachia. But when you remove all of these thousands of men, who's left to take care of the farms? The old men, the little boys, the women, little girls. And it's a hard life being a farmer. Having to follow that horse around, plowing your fields, butchering hogs, mostly hogs, occasionally cattle, but cattle is much harder to keep throughout the winter, butchering your hogs, putting the food away. You don't have a lot of money. There are not a lot of stores to go to even if you did have money. So what you grow and produce on your farm is what you have to feed your family throughout the winter months. When we get to that Conscription Act, which is passed in April of 1862, Starts out that any male, white male, between the ages of 18 and 35, unless you are a minister, unless you are wealthy and have X amount of slaves, unless you hire a substitute and substitutes were expensive, 
back then, uh, starting out, you could hire a man to fill your job, starting out at about $500 a year, or $500, you would pay him $500 to join the army in your stead. Unless you fell into one of those exemptions, you had to join the army. And there are some folks who do not wish to do that. And these folks fall into two different categories. There are people here in western North Carolina that are pro-union. Small group, but they are pro-union. And some of these folks, as early as August of 1862, cross over the mountain and join the federal army. Bunch more go in 1863. It's a hazardous trip. There are people out there looking for you to scoop you up and put you in the Confederate army where the law says you belong. Complicated. But there are another group of men who don't want to serve in either army. Now, they are by far much larger than those that are pro-union. And we don't talk a whole lot about that third group. They don't want to serve in the Confederate Army. They don't want to serve in the Union Army. They are true mountain folks. They just want to be left alone. So we have this three groups of people running around the western half of North Carolina. It's actually true in other places of North Carolina as well, but we're going to talk about western North Carolina. You have these three groups of people. Pro-Confederate people, the men folk, are all gone to the army. Some of the pro-Union folks are starting to cross over the mountains into uh, originally Kentucky and then after September of 1863 into uh, eastern Tennessee and join the Union Army. And then you got that third group, dissidents. They don't care one way or the other. Because we have this Confederate law, the state is struggling to enforce the Conscription Act. It is a Confederate law. Governor Vance, Zebulon Baird Vance, is trying to enforce the law, and the state Supreme Court basically says, no, you can't use the state militias, what's left of them, to enforce Confederate law. And so he has to back away from that, and then they organize. Governor Vance creates this force called the Home Guard. How many of you all have ever seen the movie Cold Mountain? Go watch Cold Mountain. Came out 20 years ago, maybe. Um, it's got Jude Law in it. It's got Jewel in it. Um, in a, no, wait, sorry. That's right with the devil. I can't remember who's in Cold Mountain. Um, go see Cold Mountain. In fact, a lady asked me out in the hall a few minutes ago how true that movie was. And that's kind of a really good depiction of what the war was like here in the mountains of western North Carolina. So in July of 1863, Governor Vance creates the Home Guard, and their number one mission is to deal with deserters from the Confederate Army who, whether or not they are from here, come to the mountains to hide out along the creeks and in the valleys and the caves here in this area. If you've ever been to Linville Caverns, there's that story there about folks hiding out during the war. I don't know if they still tell that story or not. I haven't been there in a three or four years. They used to tell a story about how that was a spot for um, deserters from both armies would come hide out in that cave. So you've got deserters from the Confederate Army who don't want to serve anymore hiding out here in the mountains. You've got these dissidents, the men hiding out in the mountains because the Home Guard is out looking for them, trying to put them in the army. In western North Carolina especially after September of 1863 when the Confederates abandoned East Tennessee, becomes an absolute hell. A horrible place to try and live in. There was a group of dissidents or deserters in Wilkes County in the Trap Hill section. I guess Wilkes County is that way that numbered 1,500 men. How do you feed 1,500 men? Take a guess. It is pretty difficult. They rob and they steal. And that is the only way that they can survive. So you have these groups 
Trap Hill section of Wilkes County, Grassy Creek section of Mitchell County, Roan Mountain area of Upper Mitchell County, Shelton Laurel of Madison County. The only way they can survive is by robbing and stealing from their neighbors. And since a lot of these people are from here, it may be your cousin who shows up at your house tomorrow to take everything that you have because he's hungry or his family's hungry. And the way it kind of worked, and I've read this in multiple letters and accounts over the years, post-war accounts, wartime accounts, the way it works is that they show up, they knock on your door in the middle of the night, usually it takes place at night, they go into your cabin, which is nowhere near the size of this room. They take your mattress, your bed tick, off your bed, cut it open, empty out all of the hay or feathers or whatever is in there, and literally take everything you own and put it in there and ride off into the darkness, including sometimes the clothes that you have on your back. And this is being done to the women and children all over the mountains, East Tennessee, Western North Carolina. And so what do you do if you're at home and this happens to you? You write your husband, Dear John, the raiders came last night, took everything we have. How are we going to survive? I need you to come home. So John, Private John, goes to his commanding officer and says, Look, I got this letter. My family's in destitute state. I got to go home. Can you give me a furlough home? And John's commanding officer, his captain of his company, goes, Well, we'll write one. So he writes out, a, sends it to the colonel, and the colonel sends it to the Brigadier General, and the Brigadier General passes it on up, and the general commanding the army takes that letter and says, look, I got a dozen letters from John Company's home, John's company, requesting to go home this week, and I can't grant any of them. So no, you can't go home. And so what does John do? He slips off in the middle of the night, and he heads to the mountains to check on his family. There's an interesting story I uncovered, I've included in a couple of my books, from Cove Creek Baptist Church, second oldest church in Watauga County. And unfortunately, most minutes from churches don't, from that time period don't survive. But this church, in their church minutes, has a story in there, it's late 63, 1864, that this private they have gotten word, has come home without leave. And so they send a couple of the deacons or lay leaders of the church over to visit with this fella and say, hey, what's going on? And he writes, and this is in the church minutes, that my family wrote me a letter. They were destitute, and I came home. And as soon as I take care of them, I am going back. And he does. Three or, four later, three or four months later, he reappears in the records of his company. He's kind of lucky or blessed that he didn't get executed because the penalty for desertion is execution. Uh, that does happen from time to time in both armies, the Confederate and the Union Army. So the war here is really rough. I've found all kinds of stories over the, the past 20 plus years I've been digging into this of what the women and the children and the old men had to do to try and survive here in the mountains of western North Carolina. Um, they dug, they, they, they pried the boards off of their houses and hid food inside of them and nailed it back up. They took the cow in the house with them at night. Can you imagine that? If they heard that raiders were coming, they would send their little kids, six, seven years old, into some secluded holler on the side of a mountain someplace with whatever horse or cow or ox that they had left to try and protect them. 
they dug holes in the ground. One of my favorite stories, interesting stories, is this lady who dug a hole in the ground and put her good seed taters in the bottom of the hole and then put a layer of straw on top of that and put the rotten potatoes on top of that. So when the raiders come, and they did, they pried around in that hole and only found the rotten potatoes. These men hid out, ones hiding in the mountains, in every conceivable place that they could find. It's a story from Carter County, Tennessee, where they actually dug a pit. They had a dugout. They put timbers on the top. They refilled it with the sand. And they would hide out, three or four of them, inside that pit. And their family folks, members, would hear about them. And they would go to some prearranged location. And they would hang a bag of food. And at night, those men would come out of that dugout and find that food. In fact, burying food is a really common story. There's another instance that I recall where um, this man was out in the woods burying some of his food and one of his neighbors come by and said, Oh, John, you're burying your food over there. I see. And so he was forced to dig it up and find another location to hide his food to try and protect and provide for his family because it was so hard here in western North Carolina to try and survive. Caldwell County. How many of y'all are from Caldwell County? Okay. Caldwell County. We can talk about other counties if you want, but I actually pulled the numbers. Caldwell County, conservative numbers, there were 1,272 Confederate soldiers from Caldwell County. 305 of them died during the war. They died of battle. They died of, mostly of disease. You know what the number one leading cause of death of a Confederate soldier during the war is? Take a wild guess. Infection. Infection. Yeah, close. Starvation. Starvation. Some of them. Chronic diarrhea. So they would eat bad food or they would drink tainted water. That's, I mean, you can taint water many different ways. Supposedly, suppose that the Calvary camp is upstream from the creek that you're getting your water from. And especially early in the war, they didn't have any sense of hygiene. So, the story I read, a letter, a project I was working on last year, um, of early in the war, Confederate soldiers. They would dig latrines or a bathroom facility. It's not much of a facility, but they would dig a latrine. But early in the war, the soldiers wouldn't use it. They would just go outside the side of their tent someplace, go to the bathroom. And then you have all the animals that you're eating that you butcher right there in camp. And you have people that are sick who don't make it to the bathroom or they just go outside and vomit someplace. And uh, this story, and I actually found it two places. One place in current West Virginia and another is Jury's Bluff down in between Richmond and Petersburg. So you have all of this filth all over the ground. And then when it rains, all of that filth is washed down into your water source. So you have... Tens of thousands of men who are dying of disease. Mostly some form of dysentery or chronic diarrhea. Now they get other things to start off with, but that's usually what kills them. The dehydration. Do you know how many people we could have saved with Gatorade? That simple. They didn't have it. Didn't understand. Didn't understand germ theory at that point in time. Their officers and their medical officers were responsible for getting them good hygiene, but they didn't listen. Robert E. Lee said it was easier to deal, this was in 1861 in West, what's now West Virginia. He said it is easier to deal with children because you can make children do what you say. But with us adults, we don't like to listen. 305 Caldwell County soldiers died. It's a conservative number because records a lot of times are incomplete. So far I have found 51 U.S. soldiers from 
Caldwell County. Population of Caldwell County at that point in time is, in 1860 is 7,497, includes uh, 1,088 slaves and 114 free people of color here in 1860. That's probably a conservative number, all three of those as well, because I don't know what the census takers in 1860 were drinking, but they missed tons of people in the counties in western North Carolina. But that's the numbers that we have to go with. Well, Companies from Caldwell County. So the way this worked, a company is composed of a hundred men and a regiment is typically composed of ten companies or a thousand men. This is true for the North and the South. And the way that it works today, if you go join the Army, do we have any vets in here? So if you join the Army, you probably are in a company or a squad of men where you don't know anybody. Is that correct? It depends when you join, Dave. It depends on uh, where you're going. Because if you join, usually you do do an artery. So when you do get in a combat zone, you actually know each other, know how each other act. Because I was medical. Right. So I know them more about each of, each of my fellow. But you didn't fellow. serve with anybody from Caldwell County? Mm. Usually. No. Okay. No, not, not, not statewide. In this time period, all of these companies that I'm fixing the list are from Caldwell County. Company B of the 11th North Carolina, Company A of the 22nd, Companies F and I of the 26th, and Companies E and H of the 58th North Carolina all came from Caldwell County. And the way it works is this way. Say, I'm going to pretend here for a minute that I am a, an important person in Caldwell County. I'm not, but important person in Caldwell County. And I write off to the, maybe I'm a store owner, maybe I'm a lawyer, or something like that. And I write off to the governor, 1861. He would either be um, John Ellis or he dies in July of 1861. After that is Henry T. Clark. Write off to the governor and say, Governor, I would like to raise a company of men. And the governor, through the adjutant general of the state, writes back and gives me permission to raise a company of men. Standard company is 100 men. We don't have a newspaper in Lenore in that time period. If we did, then maybe I could put an ad in that newspaper. This happens in larger places like Charlotte, like Raleigh, like Wilmington. Put an ad in the newspaper going, I, Michael C. Hardy, have received permission from Governor John Ellis of the state of North Carolina to raise a company. We are going to meet on July 13th, 1861 at the courthouse in Lenore. If you want to serve in my company, come and join me. There is a $50 bounty if you enlist in my company. Well, we don't have a newspaper to do that. So in these townships or districts in the counties where people know me, say you come to my store out in Happy Valley, and I tell people at my little store in Happy Valley, hey, I'm going to form a company, tell your kinfolk. Tell those folks that you see at church. I'll be at church Sunday if you want to talk to me about it. I'll be at the courthouse during court week next week. I make that announcement. And so these companies raised in the counties in North Carolina come from certain geographical places. From Happy Valley, from the Globe, from the Gamewell area, from Hudson. I don't think Hudson was a place in 1860, but... So all of these people in this company, I am probably related to in some form or fashion. I have found brothers in companies together. I have found fathers and sons. And then when we start talking about uncles and cousins, we're probably all connected somehow. And we all enlist in these individual companies. Those companies that I mentioned in the 11th, the 22nd, and the 26th all head eventually to Virginia to fight in the Army of Northern Virginia. Those two companies in the 58th North Carolina troops head to Tennessee and become parts of the Army of Tennessee. So 
So it pulls all of these men, 1,272, out of Caldwell County. And all these families are forced, mostly the women, the old men, to doing jobs that they are not accustomed to doing. Army life is hard. You've got all of the disease running rampant through the ranks. It's a lot of work. There are a lot of privations. You don't get enough to eat. That's actually my next book coming out, hopefully in the spring. It's called Feeding the Army of Northern Virginia. And it looks at how little food and how detrimental that was to that army. At least I hope it comes out in the spring. It's been turned in. So you don't get enough to eat. You have to walk or ride a train, and trains are somewhat dangerous. Um, they frequently go off the rails, or people get out there and monkey with them because they think it's fun. Uh, there was a group from uh, here in western North Carolina that joins the 37th North Carolina troops, and they've been in Kinston for a while, New Bern for a while, but in um, April, May of 1862, they're on their way to Virginia, and this guy thinks it's a lot of fun to reach down there and pull that pin out of the cars as they're going down the road so the cars separate from the train. He does that three or four times. The last time he does it, he falls off, and the train runs over and cuts him into three pieces. So these men are up a part of these armies, dealing with the boredom, dealing with the very stressful minutes when you're in combat. They don't have good food. Sanitation is bad. Medical care is horrendous. And 305 of them don't come back. And the ones that do come back to Caldwell County, many of them are wounded, lost arms, lost legs. They're not right in the head anymore because of what all they have seen. We don't really have diagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder for another hundred years. People don't understand why they have changed. And it's a really hard time. Especially when we get to Caldwell County story, Battle of Gettysburg. 26 North Carolina troops. I mentioned that earlier that two companies from this county, F and I, companies F and company I, were a part of that regiment. They had kind of the first year or so of the war, they had been involved in the Battle of Seven Days in June of 1862, but after that battle they're transferred out of Virginia or they're in southwest Virginia or they're in western or eastern North Carolina. And so they've, their war service has been a whole lot of garrison duty. We're not doing a whole lot. After the Battle of Chancellorsville, May of 1863, they, they're regiment, their brigade, gets transferred back to the Army of Northern Virginia. And they're marching along toward Gettysburg. They muster between 750 and 800 men in their regiment in June, July 1st, 1863, late June or early July. At the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, they are thrown in about mid-afternoon and they are fighting against a group of Federals that we call the Black Hats, part of the Iron Brigade. And they are ordered to go across this little creek and up this hill and drive those Federals off of that hill and back through the town of Gettysburg. You actually have the 26th North Carolina on one side and the 11th North Carolina which has Caldwell County men on the other side. And the fighting was so intense that day between the 26th North Carolina, that Wisconsin Regiment of the Iron Brigade, that 588 men out of that 750 to 800 are killed or wounded. Company F from Caldwell County suffered 100% casualties. Every member was either wounded or killed. 
Company I was almost as bad. And then on July 3rd, they are thrown into the battle again to go up and charge the Federals on the top of Seminary Ridge. I pulled a couple of letters out of my files. First letter was written by the quartermaster of the 26 North Carolina troops on July 3rd, 1863. Battle's still going on. He doesn't tell us what time of day he's writing, but I'm going to assume it's in the morning before that charge takes place later in the afternoon. But the battle is still going on. And he writes, and this letter appears in the semi-weekly Raleigh Register on July 22nd, about three weeks later. His name is Captain J.J. Young. And he writes, I feel it is my duty to communicate the painful and melancholy intelligence to you of the death of Colonel Henry K. Burguin, who was killed nobly fighting for his country July 3rd, 1863. Burguin was like 23 years old. Colonel of the 26th North Carolina Troops. Young goes on. He was shot through both lungs and died an easy death. I have buried him as well as possible under a walnut tree leading from Gettysburg to Chambersburg, about two miles from the former place. His loss is great, more than any of us can imagine, to his country. To me, it is almost stunning, and to the whole regiment. We gained a great victory on the first of the month, the enemy losing 12,000, it is said. But though ours was not a fourth so large, his death has made it great. Poor Kincaid, his servant, takes it bitterly. The colonel, Lieutenant Colonel James R. Lane, Captain W.W. W. McCree, and eight others were shot down in succession with our colors in hand. Captain McCree killed instantly. Colonel Lane seriously, if not mortally. The regiment went in 800 strong and came out the first day with 250. On the next day, this regiment, the editor writes, in 18, June, July 22nd, on the next day, this regiment, we are informed, was reduced to 80 men. Young continues, The fighting yesterday and today has been terrible and will continue tomorrow, I suppose. General James Day Pettigrew is in command of our division, Major John T. Jones of the 26th of our brigade. This will give you an idea of the frightful losses of officers. Second letter was written from Winchester, Virginia on July 9, 1863. Battle ends July 3rd. Campaign does not end, but the battle ends. This letter was written to John H. McGearley, to his father. McGearley was struck three times during the battle and is in a hospital. And this letter appeared in the Fayetteville Observer on July 20th, 1863. McGearley writes, The battle was grand, sublime, awful. Neither language nor pen can describe the scene. The enemy was strewn in piles, some in rows, just as literally blue. Our brigade, Pettigrew's, that day was opposed to the Iron Brigade, never having been repulsed before, so I heard some of the prisoners say. But, say they, what men fought them that day, and a certain part of the line being answered North Carolinians, the Federal soldier said, I don't want to fight them again. You will see that our company did its duty. That goes back to what we talked about earlier, that family part. We want people back at home to know we've been good soldiers. You will see that our company did its duty. The regiment went into action with about 750 effective men and lost and killed and wounded and missing 549. Colonel Bergen was killed on the field while gallantly leading his men in battle, bearing our colors. Just before he died, about the last word he said was, I am dreaming. I know my gallant men will do their duty nobly. Where is my sword? 
Such were the last words of our colonel. He sleeps under a tree near the battlefield, far away from his friends in the land of the stranger. Yet he is not forgot. No, his memory will be cherished, fresh and green in the hearts of the men who have followed him until they too shall be as silent as he. May he rest in peace. Lieutenant Colonel Lane was badly wounded and I hope will recover soon. Major Jones was struck with a shell and stunned pretty badly. Adjutant Jones was badly wounded. Sergeant Major McRae's thigh shot very badly. Then the editor adds, the 26th North Carolina is Governor Vance's old regiment. That was their experiences in that time period. Why did they enlist? Some of them felt it was their responsibility to go and fight. Some of them it was peer pressure. Some of them because they wanted the money. Of course, in the, in the South, the, the money quickly depreciated. Inflation was horrible. So your $13 a month didn't go very far. Especially if you were trying to send some of it back home. We killed 800,000 of each other in the 1860s. And it was really, some folks say that it was not avoidable. I disagree with that. I think we could have avoided that conflict. So I'll open it up. Do you have any questions for me? I can ramble for hours. I don't even actually know when we get done. What time do we get done? Oh, 10.50. 10.50. That clock's wrong. <laughs> yes, sir. Y'all have any questions for me? Have you ever looked up your ancestors in that time period? Did they serve on the blue or the gray? Let me encourage you to do that, no matter where you're from. If you're from Caldwell County, I can help you out. If you're from Clinton County, New York, I can probably find somebody to help you out. <laughs> you had a question? Comment? Uh, I'm not sure if this is a... It's not a question about the uh, Civil War, but I just want to know what got you into this. Oh, what got me into this? That's a fantastic question. Um, I got bit by the history bug in 1982. I, had, I was 10 years old. I had an uncle one weekend come pick me up and take me to a Civil War reenactment. And he bought me a hat, and he bought me a jacket, and I got to carry the flag. And I went back home, and I said, Dad, this is the most incredible thing. We've got to go do this. And I grew up going to reenacting, going to reenactments. Um, you know, I, I really grew up on Sunday afternoons, mornings, my dad would go mow grass, and then he'd come lay down on the couch and take a nap, and he'd have on a western. And so for a kid who grew up watching westerns, you know, I was out there with guys with, with cannons and horses and swords, and that was a natural progression. Um, I started re really researching the time period and writing about it in um, 1995, and, I, and I've been writing ever since. I don't really go to a lot of reenactments anymore, um, but I do volunteer at several historic sites um, several weekends out of the year. Uh, as an interpreter, just trying to help folks understand pieces of the past. Uh, our past is so important, and we get so little of it. And sometimes what we do get is so bad. Uh, I've had to give up watching the History Channel on TV because all I do is yell at it <laughs> and fuss. You know, Daniel Boone did not have a railroad lantern. And sometimes it's little things like that. Sometimes it's more serious, you know, pieces of history that I think that totally wrong, but sometimes it's the little stuff. So um, if I was a drinking man, we'd have a drinking uh, There's a Railroad Lantern game, you know, with Daniel Boone or, you know, with the American Revolution because they didn't have railroad lanterns in that point in time um, or Tecumseh or somebody like that. So, so that's my progression. Um, went to school and got a degree in history, but uh, I pretty much just write and travel, at least I used to and talk and do lectures and, and um, anything I can do um, to try and tell folks, especially young folks, um, how interesting history really is. So that's, that's, that's kind of a small piece of my story. 
Yes, sir. I will um, I'll come back. You referred earlier to um, in Scone and King book. Yes. There's a very uh, many interesting stories in there. But one that's always intrigued me the most, which you, you may may remember, is that story about the um, married couple from Caldwell County, where the husband and wife were on opposite sides. Yes. The uh, the wife uh, was pro Confederate, but the husband was pro uh, pro Union. I think he had been in the Confederate Army for a while and left for Missouri or something. Eventually joined the Union Army, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, do, you, do you remember that story? Yeah, but I remember it differently. Oh. But keep going. Question, it could be a different story. It's a Caldwell County story, but keep going. Yeah, but do you have any idea what part of Caldwell County that couple may have lived in? I'll have to go home and look. Yeah. I will. There's another story in a book that came out a couple of years ago. And it, I'll have to look up the actual title of it. It's got plague in the title. But it's about this group of um, federal soldiers who desert out of um, lower um, South Carolina. They're, they're in South Carolina area, and they're making their way up here to go through the mountains and to get to federal lines in East Tennessee. This is an 1864 story. And, but the, the roles are reversed. It is the woman that they come across that is very pro-Union and will do anything to help Union soldiers. And her husband, who I think is a wounded Confederate soldier who got sent home, of course, is anti-Union soldier. Um, I'll have to send you the name of that book. It's only been out a couple of years. I can see it on my shelf, but I can't remember the name. Let me ask you this, too, as a follow-up question. How common was uh, that situation in, say, western North Carolina where... The wife was on, uh, was on one side, and the husband favored the other side. How common? Well, I don't know if we really know, if I could put a statistic to that, you know, a number to that, how common that was. Um, but, I mean, you know, today, how many people are, are for one political party and married to somebody else who's for a different political party? I, I would not say that it's... Um, I would, probably 20 or 30% of the population is like that. I don't know how you'd live with somebody like that, but they do. Um, I, I, I couldn't put an actual number to that and tell you how common. I know in many cases, um, during and right after the war, Union soldiers, especially officers, would write that the women in these communities that they're coming across were m much more hot-headed and pro-Southern than the men. So let that sink in for a minute. It is the women driving the men. Because, you know, on one hand, the women get to stay home. Early in the war, they probably thought men would be back soon. Everybody thought they'd be back soon. Most folks thought they would be back soon. But um, it is the women that are much more adamant pro-Southern than some of the men. So, you had a question. Yeah. So, originally I was going to ask you about how um, Northerners and Southerners sort of approach the basis of conflict, whether you're from moral or economic motivations, but... It's all, that's all across the spectrum. Yeah. I mean, just literally, like I said, to start with, there were three million approximately men that served in both armies and you probably have four million reasons why they serve. Yeah. So it's 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 an individual person. Okay. Um it's an individual decision for each of those people. Okay. And okay, because um the question is popping on my head at the end of your lecture was because uh, you said that the conflict could have been avoided and I'm guess my I'm curious about what each side would have had to give it up to avoid the Civil War? Well, that's a great question. What's, what would have to be given up? Um, for the South, you would have to convince... Okay, let's go back. Make sure I don't forget your question. Let's go back one second. What caused the war physically? What caused the war? Newspapers. 
the media, just like it does today, feeds certain storylines into the populace. And that has not changed. Look at the war in 1898 with Spain. Totally media driven. We can say the same thing. We won't go into modern day politics except by saying that the same thing is true today. The media drives the narrative. Newspapers, I'll hush with this, are always biased. News outlets are always biased. A hundred years ago, we were more honest about that because we put it in the title of the newspaper. We've got the Bakersville Republican and the Watauga Democrat. Newspapers were started by political parties because they wanted to advance their political agendas. When Zebulon Baird Vance is running for his first term in Congress, he starts a newspaper in Asheville, North Carolina to get his message across. That's true in the 1860s. The newspapers are stirring people up on one side or the other. Whether it's Hale in Fayetteville, North Carolina, or Horace Greeley in New York. So, number one, come back to your question. I didn't forget, which is amazing, because I get off on a tangent. And number one, the newspapers have to take a different tone. The newspapers have to come out and say, you know, hey, let's not go to war. Instead of saying that war is inevitable, let's, let's just not go to war. Let's figure out how to work this out. Number two, you have to come down harder on the abolitionist. So we all think slavery is a bad thing, right? Slavery is a horrible thing. What's been lost in the narrative, purposely been lost in the narrative of the abolitionist party is just how violent and lawless they were. Coup in San Francisco in 1854. They hung a bunch of Democrats. Riots in places like Cincinnati. Abolitionists led and motivated riots in places like Cincinnati and Albany, New York. Then you got the whole Kansas, Nebraska thing going on where their leaders are chopping people up with axes. Abolitionists are. In fact, a very famous abolitionists did that. He's the same guy who comes to Harper's Ferry and leads that raid. Y'all know who that is? That is John Brown. You know, the first person killed in John Brown's raid in Harper's Ferry was a free black man from North Carolina. So you're going to have to take a serious tone with the abolitionists. Fredericksburg, Virginia had actually talked about a citywide ordinance that banned slavery within the city prior to the 1860s. And the abolitionists got word of this and came to Fredericksburg, Virginia and stirred up a bunch of stuff. And Fredericksburg said, nope, we're not doing that. So we today in whatever year it is, 2021, I don't always know what year it is, 2021, we think because we're told that the abolitionists were great bunches of people. And some of them really were. But in the 1860s, people read their newspaper accounts of what was going on in California and what was going on in Ohio and what was going on in New York and what was going on in the New England states. Uh, the abolitionist leader in the New England states, not Harriet Beecher Stowe, but her dad, gone. Um, he wanted secession. He didn't want to be a part of the United States at all. Says they couldn't do anything with slavery. Let's get out of here. Let's have our own country. That's in the 1850s. I'm giving y'all a brief version of this. Um, you know, the, um, and this later came to, to come true, but Edward, um, not Stanton, the other one, William Seward, who become a, a very prominent member of Lincoln's cabinet, in fact, probably too prominent member of Lincoln's cabinet. Um, he was one of those folks that advocated, you know, the, that the North should leave the Union in the 1850s. Uh, he also believed, which they later did, that the Republicans, if they gained control of power, should stack the Supreme Court, which they did. You've probably never heard of that before. 
But in 1860, you have two justices that die. Tawney, Roger Tawney is one of them. You have one justice that quits, John A. Campbell, who goes back to Alabama in 1860, 1861. And so they're able to fill those three, three, three seats, and then they add a tenth seat that is filled by Davis. So they stack the Supreme Court. That's all the abolitionists doing. The abolitionists doing this. So we've got to control the abolitionists. The abolitionists were also in favor of shipping all of the African Americans to Liberia. They didn't want them living with them. So, so we've got to do that. We've got to, to get the media on our side. And we've got to come up with a solution. Where, who, and we get this idea that slavery in the South is confined to the South. But it's not. It's the bankers in New York that are financing the slave trade, the big banks in New York that are financing the slave trade. It is the textile mills in New England that are buying the cotton grown by the slaves in the South to turn into cloth, a lot of times just to ship back to the South. It is Great Britain. Everybody talks about how Great Britain is and about how they freed their slaves. I think it was 1838. Well, Great Britain is one of the largest importers of Southern cotton. So they obviously, we need to, to figure out where Great Britain really is. Uh, and then it's the Midwest farmers that are growing all of this grain and all of these hogs and shipping them down the Mississippi River to feed all of those huge slave plantations along in Louisiana and Mississippi. So it's this national thing going on. Well, we've got to come up with an alternative to grow cotton in the South. Slavery is not very profitable. Slaves are expensive. They're expensive to buy. You got the whole moral thing, but slaves are expensive to buy. They're expensive to take care of. We have to deal some way with the influx of immigrants in New England or in, in, in New England, um, in New York. Um, they are a lot of times treated worse than the slaves. Why? Because there's a boat of them that comes in every week. And we can get them a job working in the textile mills making cotton, making clothes out of this cotton or making clothes out of wool. And <clears throat> we don't have to give them medical treatment. We don't have to treat them nice. We don't have to pay them enough. We don't have to feed them. So we've got to somehow get these two worlds to align. Newspapers, we have to fix them and get them on our side saying, hey, we need to work out a solution. It would have been cheaper for the United States to have paid and bought every slave than it would have been to fight that war. Physical dollars. You could have bought every slave. And slavery is just not in the South. I mean, there are still slaves in New Jersey. There are slaves in Maryland, Maryland Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri. You could have bought every slave and paid a fair wage and set all of these people free for what it cost the United States money-wise to fight that war. So the first thing, the biggest thing we have to do is we have to talk and work this out. And people were just not willing to do that. They were more interested in arguing. The abolitionists were interested in arguing. The hotheads in the South. Remember, most people don't care. The common citizen doesn't really care. But the few hotheads in the South, including a few here in western North Carolina, like W.W. W. Avery, and Thomas L. Klingman. Um, that guy from Asheville, I forgot his name. Um, so, you would, could have bought every slave, as I said, for the amount of money it took to fought that war. And that's not including the destructiveness wrecked across the South. Um, Mississippi in 1860 is the wealthiest state in the nation. And it's still one of the poorest to this day. So, I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but that's some of the things we would have to do is to get folks talking and working in, in a common direction and not screaming and yelling at each other. Um, there are a lot of things that took place, the Missouri Compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, but at the same time, you have to realize that we are really two different places uh, as a nation. Um, the people in New England don't think like the people in the South. Still don't. 
to some degree. Whole Puritan thing and, you know, Georgia's full of convicts. and Y'all knew that, didn't you? Georgia was started as a place for convicts. <laughs> Anybody from Georgia? Oh, good. I'm sorry. I wouldn't offend anybody. Uh, but there were a lot of convicts in North Carolina, too. There were a lot of people in early North Carolina history who had originally settled in Virginia, and the Virginia laws are so fierce that they said, no, we're not going to do that. And so they start going into northeast North Carolina to get away from the Virginians. But that's not here or there. Uh, yes, sir. Michael, could you uh, check the chat box there? Chat box. I, asking, I can't see it from here. I can't tell any question. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Your comment is the last one. You're good. There's nothing in the chat box. Okay. Any other questions for me? I had one other question, uh, Michael. Uh, last uh, year when you came, you talked about the uh, dissidents, the, uh, those people who didn't choose. They weren't for either side. They wanted to be left alone. And I got in my notes, I was looking at this uh, yesterday and this morning, that um, the number of dissidents in Avery, what is now Avery County, uh, Yancey and Mitchell, <laughs> was almost the same number of people who fought for the Confederate Army in those counties. Do you have any idea of uh, that of comparison between those two groups in Caldwell or Watauga County as far as uh, uh, dissidents versus the number of Confederates? Watauga worked out about the same. Caldwell we're actually working on right now. I see. Um, it takes a long time to take that 18... What we did is we took the 1860 census and created a spreadsheet of every male who is somewhere between military age, which on the spreadsheet is usually between 10 and 55. So a 10-year-old in 1860 is going to be 15, and he might lie about his age and join the Army because that happened quite a bit. Uh, and then we take that spreadsheet and we go through every single name trying to figure out which side they joined, when they joined, where they killed, where they deserted. And we still come up just about as many dissidents as we do pro-Confederate people or people who enlisted in the Confederate Army. Um, but it takes years because that's, you know, not a full-time job. It could be a full-time job, but it's not a full-time job to sit down and try and figure this out on a county level. Um, so I don't know when we'll be done with the Caldwell County side. I literally just finished the Watauga, or the, the Tow River Valley section um, two months ago, and we worked on it for 10 years. And I still, somebody shot me a note the other day about this fella, um, who would have been in Caldwell County in 1860, I think. Um, but he's buried in Avery now um, that was a Union soldier. But he does not have a compiled service record. He only has a pension application. And I did, had never seen that application. It's a card. Um, and, you know, I, I have to go back in there and update my list. So he was a clerk, Dothard Clark. So maybe... I, and I wish more people took studies like that on because it paints a realistic picture of what these counties were like. Um, but maybe next year we'll have call well done. I don't have call well done right now. Any other thoughts or questions for me? I'll turn it back over to you, sir.